one of the crowd favorites, uh, usually here to talk about IPv6. Um, today he's going to go a little cloudy. Um, given the weather outside, I think it's probably uh, very appropriate. But anyway, let's put your hands together to welcome Wim Hendricks, who is Director of Consulting Engineering at Nokia. He'll talk about clouds. Wim? Thank you. I can walk around, right? Yeah, so the topic I wanted to discuss uh, today is a bit cloud is in the air, uh, but actually what we actually have to say is cloud is everywhere, right? And I think you also saw it in the previous presentation, you see different forces that are driving different clouds into the network. So one is you see uh, cloudification of internal functions like the radio, the core of a 5G implementations are getting implemented uh, based on, on, on cloud implementations. You see clouds being distributed in the service provider network to solve latency or some other uh, application issues. And you see, of course, a mix between private instantiation and uh, hyperscalers that actually uh, drive some of these implementations, right? Now, why is this important, right? And the thing that I wanted to talk to in, in this keynote is basically automation and the way we have dealt with that in the past. I believe I, what I wanted to do is challenge the way that we approach that right now, right? And the reason I want to do this is the following, because I have been going through a journey to actually implement 5G solutions on this type of framework, and I have to say it's a challenge, okay? For example, uh, to give you a bit of a context, when you onboard an application, let's say 5G core, a radio, even the networking side of things, we all come with our own automation solutions, right? And as a result, if you want to implement something along these lines, we'll end up with a huge amount of systems that we all have to integrate, and our service providers, which are consuming that, are getting a challenge with respect to that. And what I wanted to discuss a little bit is having gone through my own experience on onboarding this and actually saying, okay, let's look at different approaches to actually help our service provider to be successful in this challenge and even take into account the next step that we want to get to is we are talking about the metaverse and how we can look at virtual reality and see how our networks behave and stuff like that. What can we do to actually change uh, that, right? Now, as I mentioned, there is a bunch of things that are happening around us. And if you look to the network side of things, the way I would say is we are surrounded by the clouds, but we are actually surrounded by a lot of cloud native applications, either uh, which are implementing those internal network functions, but are also implementing applications. So as a result, you see a new operational model appearing with respect to that cloud native workloads that are actually surrounding the networking side, right? Now, do we believe that as a networking industry, we can continue the way we have to do so? And I believe, let's challenge this, and I will give you a few cases what, what we believe should be done in order to address that much better to get to a cloud native operation also in the networking side of things to actually follow what our applications are doing. Now, if you look to automation, you have to look at all the aspects of it, right? It's not just a technology. If I look at automation, I look at it as it's a product. And a product that you, as a customer, actually have to maintain. There is a life cycle to it. There will be new releases. There will be new capabilities which you want to enhance. And so you need to basically follow and have a setup that actually is supporting those new capabilities, those new software releases, and those new systems that are around us. And I would challenge anyone that implements this with proprietary technology. Because that means that the people that you need to have and the tooling that you need to build to support it, the effort to actually handle all of that is going to be uh, very high, to also to maintain it and to keep it up to date. So why am I saying I look at it as a product? If you build a piece of software, what do you do? 
you have module testing, you have system testing, you have a whole bunch of tooling around it that actually helps you to get to the journey of the life cycle. So we have to think of automation in the same way. We are building a product, we need to have the tools to actually help us to manage that life cycle. And we have to look at it as the way we actually develop software somehow. So that's one. The second uh, important aspect is automation is actually impacting different layers, right? And of course, we look at the lowest layer, looking at the device side of things, and then we have controller layer, we have orchestration layer, and so on, and maybe there is other layers, and so on and so forth. But they all have different characteristics, right? And the characteristic that I uh, highlight here is, is uh, one, model-driven. And the way we think of model-driven in the networking, typically that is a Yang-based uh, representation of something, right? And there can be multiple flavors of it and different vendors have different opinion and we try to standardize Yang models and so on and so forth. I'm not advocating that we will have to standardize on a given Yang model. I believe we have to work with what we have today, right? But what is actually essential, in my view, if you look at automation as a product of a Yang-based model or a model-driven implementation, it's a programmatic way to interact with a device. Okay, what does that give us as a property? And that's how I looked at it when I was looking at this problem. I want to code generate all that plugins. I don't want to develop it manually. I just want to actually do code generation because we have a product, we have a programmatic representation of how that device operates. Let's code generate all of the plugins that we need in order to support that, right? And of course, we not only want to look at configuration management, we also want to look at assurance, and we need to have then the necessary telemetry to support that, right? And I would challenge everyone that implements an automation product that doesn't actually comply to those requirements, the maintenance and the effort that you have to, in order to support such a thing is going to be way higher than if you have the right uh, elements into the chain, okay? The third thing that I want to, to mention is automation is not just about technology, right? There is people and there is processes around it, right? How many ops tools are we talking about these days? And I'm meaning DevOps, we have SecOps, we have GitOps, <laughs> we have DataOps, <laughs> and probably there is lots of them, right? Now, why is that the case, in my view? is because we have to look at automation from an operational angle, right? And we have to build the system with those capabilities in mind, meaning the DevOps, the NetOps, all of those capabilities should be intrinsically uh, implemented by the solution. And I would say, why are we doing this? It's because we need to have an, a system in place that does or allow us to collaborate, right? So for me, DevOps, NetOps, and stuff like that, it's all building a system that actually help us to collaborate and not throw things or send an email to X, Y, and Z hoping that someone will pick it up. We actually have to have the system in place that allow us to collaborate and not only automate the technology, but also automate the processes and the people that we have around us to actually implement that, right? And as such, uh, if you look at collaboration, the best collaboration tool that I'm aware of, at least in software development land, is Git. And not everyone actually looks at it from that perspective, but you can do a PR, you can do change requests, you can trigger a CI-CD pipeline, you can basically trigger certain events, and then maybe let's take a step back to the metaverse, eh? so we could say, okay, I want to see how this change affects my digital, and I want to implement it on a digital twin, and want to see how it reacts. These are the tooling that you all have at your exposal to actually when you start endorsing those type of tools, right? And that's why I'm saying, let's not just look at it from a technology point of view, but also look at it from processes and people and how we collaborate around that automation uh, thing because we are, have to deal with changes and so on and so forth. Now, the fourth thing that I wanted to highlight, which is actually where it started from, is 
um, what we call here specialization versus generalization. Now, the way we, as a vendor, right, work with our customer is what we do is we say, okay, we own a domain, let's say networking, or it can be optical, or it can be a data center, and so on and so forth. And what we do is we say, okay, if you want to do automation, okay, we'll build you a product, and I will always make the analogy to a house, eh? because when you build a house, you basically, you're decorating it, you're designing it in the way that you feel is the most appropriate, right? And as such, what happens is, every vendor believes it's built the best house for that particular environment, right? And the net result is, if you look under the hood, a house, it has the doors, it has the windows, and so on and so forth. They come from actually the same baseline as many other products, right? So as such, the question is, is this the right approach going forward when looking at automation? Because that means that if you look at it from a customer point of view, you have to integrate all of these houses somehow together and make them work as a single entity to actually solve your automation challenge, okay? So now let's look at different approaches, right? I think everyone here has a smartphone, right? And if you look at, for example, the cloud, which is another instantiation, eh? so take AWS as an example, right? If you implement RBAC rules, let's say, or control who's, who is able to access what, if you implement a VPC, or if you implement a Lambda function, or you implement an EKS cluster for Kubernetes, you are not going to have a different IAM system that does RBAC or resource control and so on. You use the IAM tool for that, right? And that is also true for all these different examples of all these uh, Android systems. Uh, there is different cloud implementations that use generic mechanism to do so. So why can we not do the same for automation in our space? And I believe, and actually uh, having gone through the journey, you actually see that Kubernetes is that operating system on which we can all build, right? Now, everyone will say, okay, we're all building on Kubernetes because we built our application in a cloud-native way, so we're all good. And I say, we are not. Because what are we doing? And this is, for me, the key difference, and it's probably hard to get into the bottom of this, is we all say, I would say that everyone is building on top of Kubernetes, right? So we are building cloud-native applications, microservices, and whatsoever, but we are all doing it our own way, meaning you are not leveraging the Kubernetes ecosystem to do DevOps, to do GitOps, to do all of that stuff. What I'm actually saying here is let's build our applications within Kubernetes. And that's a key difference because that will allow us to leverage all the tooling and the huge ecosystem that is around it. So that means if you want to control who is able to access what, if you want to use GitOps, if you want to set up a CI CD pipeline and stuff like that, you get it out of the box. The only thing we have to do is build an application for automation that, for example, says, okay, I want to instantiate uh, a slice in my network, right? And that's, that's my automation task. That's what I'm going to deliver, but I don't have to care about all the ecosystem, how I do DevOps, how I do uh, GitOps and stuff like that. You just build the application within the framework and you get all of these things for free, right? And this is the new approach we are advocating that we should actually go through because the net result is that if our customers are going to use that product. They don't need to have a different instance of X, Y, and Z. They just can use that as a platform. And of course, this is a cultural change, right? Because even our customers, they are organized in a set of domains. So even with the approach that, I, that we are advocating here, you still can actually build a solution specific for uh, a specific domain. But if you would like to merge different systems and so on and so forth, you can do so because you're actually leveraging the same operating system and the same capabilities across the various domains. 
Now, you could say, okay, what is it? Uh, is this real? Is this not real? And of course, it's a change in mindset. Is the way it's a change uh, the way that we are actually uh, operating. And as a result, what you see is if you look to this cloudification, you see that the edge is actually a new territory, right? Now, so as a result, we I started to work with Elisa as a customer, which actually endorsed this approach to actually implement these edge capabilities. And another nice attribute that you get for edge, which is there is many distributed uh, instances, which means that the footprint that you have to have for your automation needs to be extremely low, right? So the approach that we took also allows to actually build a solution that is actually not going to add a huge amount of horsepower just for your automation tooling. So you basically build that app within that cluster or that edge environment, and as a result, you actually benefit not only from the whole ecosystem that Kubernetes gives you, but you also benefit from the footprint on which your application is built. And that's another big uh, aspect that, uh, that we believe is, is important. Now, the second thing that you could say is, okay, nice talk, maybe you like it, maybe you don't like it, but assume you like it. Do I have to throw away everything that I was doing? And the answer is no, right? So what you see is that the way we have approached this is you could go all the way, so from the lowest level all the way up, but you could also basically extend your existing system and plug them into the Kubernetes framework in order to allow you to leverage that whole ecosystem. So in other words, it's not revolution, it is actually evolution, right? And that is another key characteristics because uh, we all have to be realistic. We are not going to change the mode of operation from one day to another. We actually have to give you that smooth uh, transition, right? Now, if you really want to get into the details, I would really invite you to our boot. So we actually have all of this running. It's available, so it's at your disposal to actually watch and touch and feel, right? And you see that we actually took slicing as a use case to actually implement this, right? So which is actually the new uh, big uh, topic. So we basically focused on uh, yeah, a gaming application and where you actually implement various slices for low latency and high bandwidth and actually use this approach in a real network to actually do that differentiation and do all the automation activities uh, to actually support that, uh, that service end to end. So with that, I would like to conclude and I would say, let's, I hope that I challenged you on the automation and I would love to have uh, conversations with you around the approach. So I would say Kubernetes is not only for uh, orchestrating containers, it actually can also be used really well for automation activities because it's inherently an automation platform. So with that, thank you.